Greetings, Spanish orphans and retrogrades. Today, we're talking Catholic Fight Club. Why and when a Catholic should reasonably understand when to get into Imbroglio's fights. And we haven't talked about this a lot between the four of us. We just thought it was an appropriate topic for CMASK. And I understand there's a lot of there's a lot of hairiness involved in the topic. Street fighting. Uh, I'll just lead off by saying in my partly or largely misspent youth, uh, a lot of my street fighting experience comes from situations where I was not perfectly virgin clean in a- avoiding all acts of aggression, uh, according to the Mr. Miyagi principle. That's that's, of course, what what one should do if one wants to live according to uh, God's law and the catechism is you know, only only protect yourself, only strike as according with the principle of double effect. But realistically, um, that's not how I did it. And realistically, it's it's a little hard to learn some of the ins and the outs of street fighting uh, without making some some mistakes, tactical errors, but also moral moral hazards. So with me today, because it's a Christian masculinism show because it's Friday. I'm joined by my three friends, Elliot, Michael, and Will. You guys know them from past Sea Masks. Elliot, and then Michael, and then Will. How are you gentlemen doing today? Doing great, my brother. Proud to be here. Excited to talk about whooping ass, because sometimes that's what men got to do. I think we're built that way, and that's how things become great, right? Nothing is really uh, unfolded without some bloodshed, and so maybe this is something that we got to do i like it i like it elliot how about you mike your your army ranger mike what's yeah, up yeah and uh yeah it's off my first cage fight a couple months ago so yeah it's an appropriate topic it's uh near and dear to my heart uh i think you know i, I echo elliot's sentiment your sentiment as well you know it's um i don't think we're christianity is not about absolute pacifism i mean there needs to be times where it is ethically appropriate for the defense of self and others and uh you need to have capacity when, when needed yeah right. i agree happy to be here guys we need to talk about why meekness isn't weakness and what turn the other cheek really means and doesn't mean beautiful beautiful yeah i mean look there's there's a there's a historical set of contingencies. I don't want to do too much preempting and set this up. I actually want to talk about how and when to fight. But um, the, the, the preemption goes like this. Uh, meekness is not weakness. We're not, we're, we're, we're not denying that. that. That's what we always put forward here on CMASK. But the fact of the matter is saying, yes, yeah, stay, stay out of fights. This is a good bit of uh, prudential wisdom if you call it that but so is stay out of arguments and no one can do this no 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 human being can stay out of all arguments just as no man can stay out of all fights in my estimation without compromising some principle so today's show is is hairy for the reasons of pearl clutching uh there there are pearl clutchers out there that are like if you've ever been in a fight you ain't catholic or something for one thing to the extent that whatever anyone does when they get into a fight is sinful, any contributory sin on, on the part of the Christian. Well, you go to confession for that afterwards. But we're also saying as a matter of principle, it sounds like a combination of what um, Will and Michael just said, that there is a principle by which you're, you're living according to the principle of double effect. M- you know, Mr. Miyagi, kind of what he teaches Daniel, and you fight only for the defense of others and any damage you do is a, uh, is a, a double, a justified double effect an unintended foreseeable consequence of defending yourself or others. But I mean, yeah. So again, double disclaimer today, we'll be talking about some of the stuff from, from the past where, you know, I, for my part in a lot of these hairy situations I've been in, I was a contributory factor as a young man, high school and college street fights. So th- there it is. That's let's let's get that out of the way right up front. Will you want to explain precisely what you mean by meekness ain't weakness? Yeah. So to take the example of 
a guy who never gets angry, well, that's a failing because there are things that sometimes warrant anger and anger is just a, a natural passion that prompts us to do things, to get things done, to fix things. So if you're a teacher, for example, and your class is misbehaving, you'll start feeling angry because you're supposed to correct them so they learn properly. If you're a parent and your kids are misbehaving, you'll start feeling angry as well because you want them to behave the way that they should. Now, the weak man, he won't feel that anger. Maybe he doesn't even care about fixing things because he's too nihilistic. He's happy to let it all slide. We're missing, missing Will. To fix Elliot it. And Michael. Sorry, we, you froze for a while there, Will. He's happy to let it all. You said the weak man's happy to let it all go without getting angry or something. That's it. Yeah. I don't know if the stream froze then, but then, it, yeah. yeah the, so the weak man is happy to let things slide, but the meek man, he has the right amount of anger at the right time in the right way. Beautiful. Aristotelian. Yeah, that's. That's the thing. Mike, you said Catholics ain't pacifists, which is a uh, corollary of what Will said. Y you want to develop this a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're called upon to regard the um, dignity and rights of others and uh, of ourselves. And generally, when society is going well, then there is no need for uh, any type of encroachment uh, or bristling or or use of force but if yeah you you see the um whatever the, the axe wielding murderer charging at grandma then it's being a pacifist is not the time to uh it's not the appropriate action and uh it's disregarding her rights and uh her dignity by standing back and letting her get attacked so you know and at least in minimally in the case of other defense uh having justified violence or justified use of force is, is definitely uh, a Christian thing. Uh, and then with, with one's own self-defense or, or defense of one's own, you know, home or property, same damn thing. Um, so, you know, th then we can obviously get into like, you know, what's the degree of like proportionality that you're bringing to that? Uh, that that's a question, but minimally, you know, the, the right and the capacity uh, probably ought to be there, especially if you're a man. On that note, Elliot, what of what of Christians who will say, well, sure, you can defend yourself against an axe or you can defend grandma against an axe. But what about outrageous speech? What about little um, yet outrageous provocations against you or grandma? I mean, even the law recognizes as a non-protected area of speech something called fighting words. There are words that with any man whose testosterone count is higher than Brittany Griner's, then he's going to land in a fight. It, you know, win, lose, or draw, he's going to land in a fight if this guy has any honor at all. There's fighting words. What, what do we say to that? Well, that's where it all begins, right? The pen is mightier than the sword. And the American Revolution was begun by Thomas Paine with his writing common sense. Uh, and so the war of physicality begins mentally well obviously spiritually first but then it makes its way on the scene with words mm. and so i think that we are and have been and it's very clear that we've been losing the war on words in these most recent decades uh where we're not willing to say no that's wrong uh we're not willing in many cases to rebuke and to speak out and to point out not just in a defensive way but in an offensive way, because when mm. there's evil, there needs to be an attack against evil. Evil, evil will push and creep in and sneak through any gap you give it. And if it is not confronted at its first, uh, when it first appears, it will it will just take you straight to where it's taken us today. So I think that we're talking. Fight club, we're talking spilling blood, pulling out swords, and doing what we got to do to slash down evil flesh. But, brothers, it begins with our willingness to take control of this conversation. Uh, we got to be willing, like our savior, to be hated by speaking up, speaking out, and pointing out 
where the fight has begun. Spells, words. I'm glad that we're all in agreement there. It doesn't surprise me, but it makes it convenient going forward because those folks out there, and I was getting some of it on Twitter already before we started, that were starting to, to throw into a purity spiral and to clutch their pearls, go, go pull their pearls out of their heirloom closet to clutch, are, I, I would say that 90% of the time or better, these are the same folks that would at a dinner party, if an important enough matter came up for dispute, They'd be the kind of people saying, shh, don't just let it go. Let, let it go under you, whether someone's speaking serious error at the table or not. And we've quoted this Augustine uh, quotation before on the show. Hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage, that, meaning that anger and courage are a way to get to hope. Whereas if you don't have righteous anger and Aristotelian courage, then in a, in a hairy political situation and a hairy demographical situation like we have today, I just mean lots of evil all around, you have no grounds for hope. And this does begin with willingness to speak up. But, but we don't want to cop out. We don't want to cop out. So I, I, I think it's a totally great groundwork to lay that we have to say almost all street fights between men begin with words. I don't, I've never been a part of one uh, solo, uh, you know, one on one, or most of them are are actually more like brawls, three, four on four, five, or something like that. Um, that don't begin with words. They all begin with words, in my experience. And a lot of those were pointless words. They weren't debates over theology or philosophy necessarily. But those can go that way too. Me, look, Mike. Me and you have this resounding critique of academics in our most recent book, Don't Go to College, right? And one of the main things I I really disliked about 99% of the academics I've ever met is they think that anything should be entertained, even the conservative ones, even a lot of Thomists. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, even Pope Francis, in the one quote he's ever made that I liked, said, if someone insults your mother, like Mother Church, you punch him in the nose. I think that might be the only time I've ever mm -hmm. affirmatively quoted Francis. Academics don't believe that. And they have a sort of urbane, pseudo-genteel, cultivated uh, weakness. Uh, and, and it turns my stomach. Should anything be tolerated or should we, should we get away from this academic mode of thinking about dialogue? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a cultivated tolerance that, that devolves into nihilism. And, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, there, there's it, you, you don't enter into a, a reciprocal dialogue with, with evil. You don't enter into like a reciprocal pluralistic dialogue with insanity. You, you fight that, you draw a line in the sand, you push back on it, you call it out, you, you confront it, you, you drive it back in the shadows. You don't, you don't sit down and have a, a, a an adult conversation with it. Uh, and, and that's the, 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 it is the the default posture, or at least it pretends to be in academic in the academic circles, right? We're, we're just going to have an infinite conversation about about any <laughs> any pluralistic, insane idea possible for the sake of pluralism, for the sake of tolerance. Otherwise, I don't want to be called a bigot. I don't want to, be, you know, I don't want to be accused of having convictions, um, which eff effectively is. If you have convictions, you get called a bigot. So, you know, you wouldn't want to be called that. So, uh, yeah, just in infinite nihilism and in infinite tolerance. It seems well, like he that only goes one way, though, right? Like, so the tolerance, you're supposed to tolerate absolutely everything that's diabolical, but anything mm -hmm. that has boundaries, anything that's righteous yep. is intolerable. And so we have this issue now with censorship, right? And so it it's all, if I understand correctly, and maybe you guys can tell me if this is true or not, but I don't think freedom of speech is a Catholic virtue value. Uh, in fact, there are certain things that I believe we are really not supposed to say because they can pervert, they can ca cause scandal. And there's certain conversations that should just be actually censored. But it's almost like the the that has been turned around. Everything has mm. obviously been turned around. We're now like anything that would stand for what's right, what's good, what's true, what's beautiful is shut down. But then from the 
Catholic traditional perspective, it's almost like, well, you're allowed to say whatever you want now. Yeah, the, the, the Catholic position is that truth and error don't have equal rights. In fact, error, strictly speaking, has no rights. Now, what we've got, I would argue now, Elliot, you pointed out exactly what's happened is that truth is the thing most suppressed because truth often hurts, it stings. And error is the thing that needs defending so much because it has to be ring fenced because it can't fight fairly. Mm. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about this for one second um, because it's, and I think this is an important topic that we're going to have to deal with in our integralism show. If we ever do that, there's, uh, Pio Nono, Pius the Ninth, and the syllabus of errors. Error has no rights. Uh, great, great quote. Lots of Catholics online who don't understand the context spit this out all the time. Um, even in the American tradition, un- in 1791, let's say error qua 1791 when the First Amendment was ratified. The jurisprudence at the time was called the Zenger jurisprudence. Under the Zenger laws, all the First Amendment free speech in America meant was, I'd I'd use drum roll if I had it, no prior restraints on speech. No prior restraints simply meant the government will not figure out what you're going to say if you're going to give a talk on such and thus at a given time, show up and silence you beforehand. But any any law, particular state laws, we're talking about not federal laws, which are all illegal and ungodly to have strong federal laws, which is what integralists in America want are, are strong federal laws, which is why it violates subsidiarity. But state laws that say, look, if you say thus and such, it's illegal in the state of Mississippi. The police can show up, wait for you to say it and arrest you. That did not violate the First Amendment. Until it's like the only right in the Bill of Rights that's actually been hollowed out and enlarged upon in a false way. All the other Bill of Rights rights have been drastically uh, shrunk by the state between 1791 and now. But the Zenger laws are all that stood for. And and so, yes, it's true. Absolutely. Well, to say, you know, your mother wears the uh, equator as a belt or whatever, except a more serious um, slur against someone's mother in a basketball game, that's going to lead to a fight. And Pope Francis says it should lead to a fight. So do you have the right to say something crass or untrue about your opponent's mother? No, you don't. You do have a certain kind of right, though, to to utter it into the air surrounding your mouth. And then the other guy has a kind of pseudo right, same as you have the right to say that untrue thing. He has a pseudo right to punch you in your mouth. So I think there's a lot of confusion about speech, whereas there need not be. This is a relatively simple issue. If you say something that's an outrage, it's fighting words and it's not protected under the First Amendment. Fighting words are not protected. Is is interesting that the tradition of dueling, though, so like the fight with weapons, that was mainly a Germanic pagan thing. And the church condemned it and has always condemned dueling as basically endangering your life, which properly speaking belongs only to God. And even having your honor insulted isn't an excuse for getting involved in a duel, properly speaking. So it's a difficult line to tread, isn't it? Because there are examples of big guys who got into street brawls. And if you connect a punch in a way that from one perspective is lucky and from the other tragic, the guy's dead. Or if he hits the curb in the wrong way, he's dead. So it's one that I would suggest, uh, if at all possible, walk away from it. Always walk away from violence. I think that's the smartest move. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I I mean, there are three Catholic encyclicals, three papal encyclicals, on dueling, they're all utterly univocal. They say the same thing. You cannot kill someone because they insulted your honor. You know, mm-hmm. you, you abs- it's an absolute no. There's no principle of double effect. The principle of double effect, just so everyone's clear out there, doesn't even protect you. If someone breaks into your house, you get out your gun and they start retreating 
they hold their hands behind their head. They're, they're, they're making you convinced that you're actually safe in the, the midst of that intruder's retreat. You, the principle of double effect would not apply if you shot them in the back as they're running out of your home. You don't have the right to do that morally or legally in even the most conservative states. The, the principle of double effect means that there's a foreseen but unintended consequence where if someone's advancing on you, you kill them. But what you're really intending is to defend your uh, your family's life or your own life. That does not apply if they're retreating. So let's be really clear about that. While the indiscretions of, of youth where, where one picks up experience in street fighting, I'll speak on my own behalf, do not stand for the moral propositions that are defensible that we're, that we're propagating here. Um, we're talking about it is at some times right to buy Catholicism has never, never promulgated pacifism. But here are the rules. Here are the rules of engagement. It is basically is defense only. And that involves probably a lot of a lot of experience that goes into someone defending themselves when maybe it wasn't pure defense. So I've, I've said that a couple a couple times now. Does this make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So if it's purely about personal honor has been insulted or someone's challenged you calling you a coward, then getting into a fight over that, especially if it in olden times involved pistols, that's wrong. But if someone's coming after your family, for example, and you've got a duty to protect them, then we're talking a different situation. Can I jump in here as a question? Is it the distinct, is it the, is it the lethality of dueling that they're making it? That's making it prohibitive, or is it, or is it just merely mutual violence, qua mutual violence? I, I mean, think like this, challenging somebody to a, to a, a bare knuckle boxing match is, is that under dueling or not? I think dueling is to do with the weapons, but the main reason the weapons are bad is identified as being that dueling is in itself sinful and reprehensible um, in that it is an arbitrary attack on God's right of ownership as regards human life. So I can see a situation where you've got bare knuckle fighting or no rules. No let's say, yeah, sure, so let's say short, short of lethality. We, we were, you know, we're pretty sure right. no one's going to die. Ooh, right. Is, is that off limits or no? The reason that given here is the threat to life. Yeah. Okay, so there's there's a potential. Okay, De my brother told me I've never been able to find it, but he doesn't tend to get this stuff wrong. There's one or two papal encyclicals that mention the lyseity of pugilism, boxing, and um, again, he doesn't tend to get that stuff wrong. I just haven't found. It. I, they might not be encyclicals titularly devoted entirely to to boxing but but there are some expressions that it's okay that it's mm -hmm. it's morally okay to box I, I yeah i think I, this is okay so what we're really talking about then is it it should be under these parameters if that's true licit to um get into it on twitter i mean this is what i want to talk about but first since we're just by way of closing the war with words segment and move on as the chronology always goes in a fight to the words aren't going to do. Let's let's fight each other, which which seems to happen to all those people out there that that fancy themselves genteel and cultivated to the point of being beyond fighting. Look at Twitter. Look at Catholic Twitter. You guys tend to stay out of this a lot, but look at trad Catholic Twitter there. I mean, there are there are some real rabble rousers there and they're they're kind of loud and they're not that few and they're going around making some serious insults and, and allegations against folks character. I've been really frustrated on Catholic Twitter more than on, you know, non-Catholic Twitter. So if you think that you can, if you're one of these guys that doesn't speak up that much, but is like, I could begin speaking up at dinner parties when someone's running down the church, say I could speak up and I'm sure being be convincing. OK, but what if you're not convincing? Things escalate. And short of just saying the postmodern agree to disagree. I'm not saying it's natural to wind up fighting at a dinner party because it's not. 
But this is where it does go. When you speak up on behalf of your beliefs, parish orphans, retrogrades, people out there, Elliot, isn't, aren't we kind of saying here you are running the risk of fighting? And that's why some of these quiet guys out there don't ever run that risk because they don't want to wind up in a fight. Well, yeah, getting into a fight is uncomfortable, right? Um, that kind of conflict and that kind of uh, resistance fighting against is difficult, man. And I also, though, am, I'm sitting here and I'm I'm struggling a little bit also because just yesterday I was listening to a sermon on uh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? The Beatitudes, where Jesus, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are persecuted in my name and for my sake. And then we also consider Christ as our example, right? The example of the perfect man, way to live our life. Uh, Bishop Barron is pointing to a crucifix the other day and he said, there is a happy man. That's a happy man there. And he went on to explain why is it that Christ crucified is the image of a happy man. And um, although, you know, I'm kind of on board with the fact that we got to fight, I struggle because then where does the WWJD come in, right? Like what would what would Jesus do? Like does Jesus say and does Jesus assert in his teachings that we are to shed blood and and knuckle up? Um or is it is Christianity I don't know. That's why I'm asking to follow Christ's example in the passion and just be detached and allow ourselves to be crucified. I, I don't know. I, I have an answer for this. Did, I don't know if anyone else wants to go, but I can, you want me to give the answer for this that I, that I would venture <laughs> Elliot. It's, that would help me. Yeah. Yeah. So remember Christ came as expiation for Adam. Christ knew for, and also he was the God man. So it would be at the very least unfitting for him to satisfy the Jewish expectations that he'd be this uh, martial military Messiah guy. But more than that, he had to go to the cross. Uh, this is, this is literally the, the, whether you buy into penal atonement theory, we're not required to or not to, but there's some variation of penal atonement theory that, justifies the cross. And so so Christ literally would not have accomplished his mission without going to the cross. You know, he, so that's what all this Peter, you but know, he who he lives by the sword. us to be persecuted as well, right? If if yes. what he says is true, when he yes. says blessed are those who hate, you know, who are hated in my name. But he, he so he says that in so in his society and for the next 325 years after his birth christians would be hated in his name right until until the the edict of milan constant uh, constantine after the edict of milan things changed didn't they rome became very christian friendly and then about 400 years later in rome 2.0 uh it became more than christian friendly it became the holy roman empire and Rome really fully embraced Christianity for another 400 years. And well, the Holy Roman Empire was kind of a disaster. The, the, the Carolingian dynasty was all of three generations for the LARPers out there. It, it fell apart until Otto the Great kind of pieced it back together. But the point is that um, the, only, the only historical way that I can look at Jesus, the patristic period, and the period in between Jesus and the patristic period, the first 300 years of Christian uh, uh, persecution, is that when Christians are in the minority, when Christendom has not yet been established, we are called to martyrdom, even red martyrdom. We're called to white martyrdom every day. But when Christians are in the majority, we are called to defend Christendom. And so we're still called to white martyrdom, but we are not called to give up, to yield to the barbarians at the gate. Christendom. Jesus came to establish Christendom. He knew he wouldn't establish it all in his life, and he knew he had to go to the cross. So it's kind of meekness plus. 
once Christendom has been established, the duty of the Christian is to defend it. And I would, if you, if people, if people doubt that, then I would tell them all of the crusades are holy wars, except for the fourth, right? And the church has always defended the crusades and the right to crusade. You can't hold both. You can't hold the kind of absolutist, uh, as Michael said, uh, pacifism position as a Christian and still be a Catholic who holds up the crusades as holy wars. It's got my explanation or one like it has to avail us or else uh, that kind of absolutism will make either the first part of the argument or the second part of the argument fail. What do you say, Michael? I think, yeah, I think that's totally right. You know, yeah, we, once, once Christendom has been established, yeah, it's, we need to defend it and we need to defend, defend it with, with speech, with our, our own acts and eventually, yeah, with, with, with our bodies. And, uh, yeah, I think that's spot on. Uh, I'm just thinking about at the present moment, right in, in the present, I feel like we're toggling back and forth between like interpersonal defense versus like writ large, you know, the group versus the, whatever the, the swarming state apparatus right now. And I think those are two, two different things that require confrontation, um, and pushing back against, but I think they're different. Pardon me, gentlemen, I got to plug my power source in. So my computer doesn't cut out. Sorry about this. Yeah, I don't usually go platonic. I want to get your take on this, Will, and then I want to hear, um, Elliot, what what you think of my explanation. But um, the platonic answer, which is not necessarily always right, I think is right here. The soul of the individual man and the soul of the polis can be addressed in the same way, Mike, with, with regard to that little problematic that we're toggling back and forth between collective fighting and individual fighting. I mean, individuals fight in the collective individuals make an army make um a phalanx or whatever so i i think it's actually more conceptually uh less conceptually distinct than than maybe you do mike but what will what do you think of the response i gave to ellie you think it's adequate and then elliot you tell me whether i convinced you yeah i think it's adequate and if you look at what um aquinas gives as his answer to turning the other cheek he says, John 18, 23, when Christ is struck by the guard, he doesn't turn the other cheek. He rebukes him. If I said something true, why did you strike me? And then he also points again to Paul's beating, Acts 16, 22, and says, just as Christ did not turn the other cheek, Paul did not do so here either. Accordingly, we should not think that Christ has commanded us to actually turn our physical cheek to one who has struck the other. Instead, he says that Paul warned his abuser of divine judgment and retribution. But I think that idea of turning the other cheek is literal pacifism, just lying down and being helpless before somebody assaulting you has probably done more to push more men away from the church than mm. most christian concepts it seems the one there's the biggest misconception about agreed what do you think about that elliot i appreciate and like your answers all of you uh but we have to admit that that has been lost in the wash like this is a thing that many people struggle with and may be part of the reason why we've been run rough shot over for so many uh generations here now like how did that how did we fall into this place or how was it not very clear from the beginning that what you described is the case and how did we lose that sense of defending the church and fighting for the righteous reasons uh to this place where now we have you know guys who like you say turn the other cheek and allow themselves to be walked all over and stepped on well, like anything, I think it's an infiltration of true Christian teaching. And this one was probably easier to muddle than most because it's so, so hairy as it is. I mean, Jesus really sounds like a pacifist a couple times right. in the scriptures. I love the um, Thomistic interpretation that that Will just read. And I, I've looked that up before myself, but that's a that's a hairy one. I mean, yeah. the the only way that you can get a good answer is the church never contradicts herself, right? So it's kind of an argument from authority, which as a Catholic philosopher, I'm not really want to make. But 
the church, you know, the church of the martyrs, the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs, right? Well, that means the first 300 years, there was no other solution but to follow Christ all the way to the cross. 11 twelfths of the apostles followed Jesus all the way to the cross. Even though, ironically, the one twelfth of them that did not have to be crucified himself was the one that followed him to the cross on, you know, Good Friday. Now, the other 11 twelfths of them who didn't do it on Good Friday had to go to the cross other times. Think, think about that, people. It's a kind of a deep one. But um, so, yeah, for the next 300 years, this seemed to be the Christian, the church's teaching. So we're, we're, not, we're not sola scriptura Protestants. Look at what the church teaches. The church is saying, this is our historical contingent situation. Our number got pulled. We don't yet have a demographic majority. No real champions or guardians or defenders around the Mediterranean, around the globe. So if you're a Christian and you get caught, you know, saying mass in the catacombs, you're going to go to your death. It's worth it. But after that, you know, Chris, kind of middle, early middle Christendom where the Rome was so, so about Christianity, but kind of favored it. And then early Europe, that really changes the way that the church teaches about it. And the historical situation changes. It, it's not a change to the principle. The principle, I think, was always when your numbers polled and you have 11 Muslims in the street that say, you know, deny Christ or we're going to beat you up. You have to I, I think about it like this, people. Let's bring it back to the individual, because that's where I kind of want to go with the street fighting show anyway. You're in some corner of London or Paris and 11 guys say, hey, take off, take off your cross, break your own cross. We, the Muslims, like to break crosses, break your own cross, the one you have around your neck, Tim. And I'm like, look, I'm, I'm not Jackie Chan. I, I, I definitely am going to get the, the shit kicked out of me here, but it's worth it. Right. That's that's the early church. And yet if. You guys are with me in, in four or five other guys, you know, even if it's 11 to nine odds or 11 to eight, it's like, let's go, man. Let, let's go. That's the choice. And if there's 11 of them and then I have an army of 20 behind me, that was more like the Crusades, right? 20 guys jump out from behind me. It makes sense that I'm like, no, not only am I going to not break my cross, but I'm not going to be martyred. Does that make sense? I think that kind of makes it clearer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw these things. So what do you, what do you guys say? I, I think it's good. You asked that because everyone, a lot of people out there are scratching their heads, but I think it reduces to a relatively simple principle. I, I'm 11 on one. I'm not going to deny Jesus. I'm going to get my ass kicked. Uh, 11 on 11. Let's, let's go. Let's, let's tango. Um, what do you guys say? Michael? Well, I have a, slightly tangential thought here maybe i can connect it so what the muslims do really well and what the left does really well is that they claim physical space short of the, it being a, an outright physical confrontation right like they will move in packs you will find yourself outnumbered catholics conservatives in general i think maybe because of this like hyper liberalist like individualist ethic we don't really move in packs and we don't really make a conscious attempt to claim physical space in the way that muslims do really well in the way the the left does really well you don't see one antifa guy one lgbt person walking around they, they mob around in like right. like a like a giant swarm right. and they're able to take over physical spaces and make everybody else feel uncomfortable just by having sheer numbers and that's short of violence it's way short of violence but they still get their way they're still able to socially commandeer the space just by mere numbers so i think one possible solution you know that we have in our kit bag is to start moving in packs start you know jack Dunham's whatever the, the way of the gang start start moving with your bros you know get a crew together and move around in packs then see, see if those social confrontations uh, rise up or not. Yeah, it's it's the, the Reaganite principle of peace through superior firepower. It, uh, intoned really nicely <laughs> in the first Point Break movie. They're all, they, they, they quote that Reagan line a few times throughout the movie, peace through superior firepower. And I mean, that 
The same is true. Yeah, move in packs the way the Muslims do around the Euro capitals. Um, but also just being really, really big has the same peace through superior firepower effect that other things like Elliot, I don't I don't know. I don't know how many how many scrums you've been in, but you might not have to have because you're so physically big that um, I might have been in more scrums than you. I'm not uh, I'm not as large as you are, man. Yeah. And it it's kind of I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to go with this. But I started learning firearms training a couple of years ago. And I'm like, OK, this is great. I live in Florida. So, you know, I have a concealed carried weapon. And so, you know, I started getting on the, the, the habit of buying lots of firearms. And so here I am now. And um, even though I carry when I go, I know that just by the way I look, I'm probably not going to get messed with. And so I think the best defense is just, you know, travel. Like you said, travel in packs. Why? Because you're big. Best defense is look, look mean, look tough, look unfuck but wittable. And, uh, you know, in many cases that will defer, you know, that'll delay or defer the, the violence anyway. Mm. Be yeah. loud mouth, right? I mean, think about the animal kingdom, these various animals that you know, are small, but the big animals won't mess with them because they make they make themselves look big or they make a lot of noise or whatever the case may be. Uh, these lefties. They are squeaky wheels. They make a lot of noise. They shout and they cry and they hold up signs. Uh, that makes them seem a lot scarier than they really are. So I'm just kind of like elaborating on what you're saying, but look, giving the perception of fierceness is in many ways just as just as important, just as powerful as uh, you know being able to scrap. It's not just a numbers game, though, because. If you look at elite theory in politics, the organized minority defeats the disorganized majority. And I think part of what Michael's pointing out is that you've got people who've got real cohesion and an aim and unity. Mm. And yeah. if you look at what they've managed to achieve in so many institutions where all it takes is a couple of guys who work their ways to the top and then say, right, we're imposing this top down. And people don't know what's hit them. One is because... This has all been planned out strategically and people are already on the defensive. And then a few years go by and the institution is unrecognizable. And I think, uh, two, it's also because you've got that uh, communication between them all. So, yeah, I agree. Moving around cities and getting a group of guys together is important. But don't underestimate what you could achieve in your parish, for example, or in your community with just four guys like we are who have got a shared vision and are willing to play the long game and be consistent. Mm. The left has shown how powerful that can be. That's true. Uh, what, one thing that Mike and I talk about a lot are, you know, with all due respect, I, I don't want to get Mike in trouble, but one thing I talk about a lot and it came up once recently in a private conversation between you and I, Mike was like the Knights of Columbus and what generally speaking in most parishes, what a missed opportunity this is mm, like yeah. mm. when you and I did a show after Dobbs, Mike, one on one on my mm -hmm. channel about abor pro abortion street violence. And they remember the left was going around to churches and firebombing them and they weren't getting prosecuted. And they were also just having chicks, guys, guys that looked like chicks going in. And walking up to the altar, I, I can't express my level of disgust, disdain, not, not for the people going in the churches. I mean, that goes without saying, but for the, the, what I saw on the videos, the Catholics, a lot of times it was the, you know, flabbier, older knights that would get up because they, because they are organized, like Will's saying, organization, even in, even a really half-assed way prepares you mm -hmm. to do some, but, um, these should have these people should have been, I don't mean dispatched like like taken out with lethal lethal force, but they should have been dragged out by their damn ears. Mm -hmm. You know, they should have been dragged out of those churches bleeding. And, you know, I expressed that when we did the video. And this kind of it's the nice rapprochement of a lot of the concepts we're talking about, where the collective meets the individual. It's like, look. Mm -hmm. 
unless there are individuals that are willing to be a part of the collective and be like, yeah, man, I'll get, I'll get my hands dirty. I'll get my hands dirty. No one, but no one is coming into St. Patrick's in new Orleans, you know, which I, I consider my home church, my, my Latin mass church. No one's going to come F with St. Patrick's. I, I, I don't care if I'm the only guy there doing it. It would be much more comfortable if you if there was trouble when you four guys, you three guys were in town and there are a couple other guys at St. Patrick's that would help out. But it, I'd rather do it with 10 or 20 or 30 guys that are younger and stronger. No offense, Knights of Columbus. Then I would on my own, but but uh, damned if I'm not going to do it on my own, if that's what it comes down to. And no, it's not just about lethal force. It's about the social presentation here. And it's mm-hmm. also about you're not approaching the altar. You're not approaching the altar. This just this isn't going to happen. What I saw on video after video is a cucked, wimpy, Ned Flanders, Christian population of people that let these bitches get close to the altar. That's not happening. They need to be dragged out bleeding by the ear because you don't know what they're going to do to the body of Christ if you get them close. That's that's a near occasion of sin, and it's a sin of omission to let them get that close. Well, it also, I mean, it also signals like just tremendous institutional weakness to to allow something that like just that severe to to get that close. Yeah, yeah, totally. This is where the Protestants definitely have a a, a leg up on us. How so? Yeah, I, I agree. But how do you <laughs> yeah, mean? Because they're all like open carrying in, in the pews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing, and, though, I don't think they're as organized. I just remember listening to Jesse Romero speak about. Uh, when the Satanists were coming into Scar, Scar I think it's Scarsdale or Scottsdale, uh, and how you know all the Christians came because we're all against Satan, but how obvious it was that the Catholics were together praying the Rosary in unison. We all know the same prayers. I mean, this is huge. We've got we've got really high powered precision weapons as Catholics with our prayers. We have we have the times of prayer. We have the, the the prayers themselves. We can go to war in a unified way that Protestants absolutely mm-hmm. cannot because they're all praying off their off the dome, making yep. stuff up, and there's no really cohesion in in uh, in in the spiritual warfare or even in their liturgy. At least yep. we can get together, and if it you know, and this is something I think we kind of. I don't want to say that we skated over this. Of course, the conversation is about fight club, but <laughs> to fight the spiritual battle with the weapons that we have, like uh, the imprecatory and deprecatory prayers, the binding prayers and deliverance prayers. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of s- listening to Father Ripperger and his uh, spiritual warfare. Um, we can create some serious damage with just our cohesive, unified body of prayer then elliot that's a great point and let's talk a bit more about the thing you raised at the start of the fight over words because tim you'll know more about this than i do but a lot of the psalms i think three whole psalms and many verses were cut out from the traditional psalter um the liturgy of hours cut what many men would regard as the most masculine verses and without those and without people being steeped in them with going through the Psalms each week, a lot of what we're talking about here, it sounds odd. It doesn't sound Christian because people aren't connected to that tradition. Let me just give you an example of um, a couple of them that were cut so you can get a feel for them. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses he will shatter heads over the wide earth. Well, that one's got to go because it's about splitting skulls. So <laughs> we can't have that. Uh, another one as well. We've got you, Lord God of hosts, a God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. For the sin of their mouths, the word of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies that they utter, consume them in wrath. Consume them until they are no more. Then it will be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob. 
Now, this is the kind of tone of the verses that we don't get anymore. And I think many men reading the ones that have been cut out feel kind of outraged that this was in the tradition, but isn't now. Yeah, that's that's beautiful, man. I mean, that those inspire me. What's left in there has, has some really inspirational passages, but maybe none so great as those. And I, this serves, Will, doesn't it, as an answer to Elliot's earlier question earlier in the stream where he was like, yo, what happened? Like, how did we lose this tradition? Well, you're seeing it. It was an organized top-down effort. And my my a big part of my apostolate that that isn't quite as catchy, hasn't proved quite as catchy as some of the other trad Catholic apostolates out there. You know, you you guys know them, which, which mostly they just say, like, look, if if everyone would go to Latin mass, everything would be perfect. Now, they'll, they'll deny it when you put it propositionally like that. But that's really what they're saying. That really is what pretty much all the other trad Catholic podcasts are saying. The Latin mass will save everything. The Latin mass fell apart while we had the Latin mass. What really mm. would save Christendom, even if the bishops keep ganging it up, is men to take over their own families. And, th- and like everything we do on Fridays, gents, being willing to fight for the truth is a part of that. So and, and being willing to say, yeah. Those those uh, parts of the Psalter, which were cut out, were cut out for a reason because we were meant to be pacified, castrated, uh, kept quiet, relegated to a corner, a corner of toxic masculinity, all that nonsense. So what really can save Christendom, as we say in a different way every week, is men being the virtuous, virtue first, virtuous, strong leaders of the household. Even then, okay, your bishop... Your bishop won't allow the TLM. A lot of trads get mad at me because even though I'm a TLM supremacist, I'm like, look, Christianity is Christendom is not going to go bye bye, even if all you have to go to is the Novus Ordo, if you're in charge of your family. But people would rather have the burden on the bishops for things going wrong in Christendom than themselves. A lot of trad men are not the leaders of their family. And so they don't want to hear this. And a lot of trad men don't want to be charged fully with defending their family, which means if you go to the mall at any given time, you might have to defend your family physically. Sorry, that's what will save the West, not the TLM. As much as I really dislike the Novus Ordo and I love the Tridentine Latin Mass, no, no, there's no parity between them. I love the one. I dis, I really don't like the other. I think one's objectively better. But what will save the West is Christian patriarchs. We say that every day. And defending the family, sometimes you don't have your peace on you. You might have it on you most of the time, but you're not going to have it on you all the time. And you might have to fight. And people, and you're going to have to fight for your household because most women have been, whether they know it or not, feminized. You're going to have to fight, not physically, but with with a, a program of taking it back over. Men don't want to do that. And they don't want to be charged with maybe having to fight. They'd rather say, oh, I carry a piece. I'll blow someone away before I'll fight with my fists. Well, fighting with your fists is a lot easier. You don't have to kill someone, man. <laughs> it's a lot better. People love a victim narrative, though. And the yes. most painful thing to realize is that strong men don't get their traditions ripped out of their hands. Yep. It was weakness in the first place. That's the bit that people will like to skip over. And that's the tough message, Tim, that you're given there, but it's the truth. So I've had the thought just then that I'm just going to start going through all these censored verses from the Psalms with my son. We'll do a few of them. He's going to know them, even if he's not going to get them anywhere else. Would you make that available somewhere, Will? Or where, 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 where do, you, do you get that? Uh, I've got the link here. I'll send it to you afterwards. I've been looking for it for a while, but this page has got them all in one place. I might write an article up on these as well with some thoughts about them because it's pretty pretty interesting stuff. Sweet. Yeah, if you send that to me, I'll, I'll try to put it in show notes or put it on Twitter. Everyone, if you guys aren't on Twitter, get on Twitter. It's a great place to pick a fight. <laughs> but get on get on Twitter and follow me, Timo Theology. What, 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 do you, what do you guys have to say? Elliot, I know you might have to bounce out slightly early did we did you want to weigh in on any of the developments of today's show 
No, I think this has been a, a great talk. Um, I'm caught on prayer for a moment here now, though. I'm thinking like Padre Pio's spiritual sword, right? The spiritual weapon. Like, I, I get it. Like, you'll have to knuckle up. We'll have to draw blood. We'll have to bust some nuts sometimes. <laughs> but prayer is a weapon. Like, I love how Father Ripperger and, um, and uh, I think it's Jesse Ramirez says, they're precision weapons, right? Like these deliverance prayers are precision weapons. I think we, I think as Christians, but Catholics in particular, we could do a heck of a lot of damage if we consistently pray with intention to take out Satan, right? Make that a part of our, make that a part of our training, right? A part of our regimen and part of our battle plan. Just get out there and pull out your rosary. And yeah, read those deliverance prayers by for the lady, right? I think I've been just going through that every day and just picking those prayers just to, as like sniper weapons to take out the enemy. And so but I it, think that puts it's, us in a good position too. It's a both and though. Like, okay, let me just say this. Jesse Romero is one of my very favorite Catholics. I mean, he's just one of my very favorite Catholics. This guy teaches his sons to fight. You know, knows how to fight. He's he's, you know, a cop. He's not at all against the physical aspects of fighting that we're talking about. But, yeah, he knows that ultimately prayer is the precision weapon. So most Catholics will hear what you just said, Elliot, and go back to a comfortable space. And the reason I'm pushing throughout this show, the physical aspects of real fighting, I'm even calling it street fighting is to, to let people know, like, don't just go to your mediocre, com- comfortable, safe space of like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll, 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 you know, I don't want to deal with the kind of controversial but true uh, need for men to be willing to engage in actual fighting. I want to go to the metaphorical prayer. That I'm not saying that that's not good. It is a precision weapon. But Jesse Romero, I sh- we should have gotten him for this show. Jesse Romero yeah. is the exemplar here. We should have got, I mean, Jesse I literally comes, just listened to uh, you and Stephanie on his show um, yesterday. Oh, cool. The one cool. where you guys were talking about patriarchy and matriarchy. Awesome. He's just one of the nicest men. And, and um, you know, he's the age of my parents. And it, he's just, I just really, I have a lot of affection for Jesse. And I, I met him, you know, been lucky enough to meet him several times. And have dinner, and me and Steph have dinner with he and Anita several times. I just really, really admire the way he does things. But but I'm saying it's a both and approach, and so I don't want to let people cop. off. Yeah. yeah, boxing. Hey, fellas, I'm gonna bounce. Uh, I made a mistake in double book today, but this has been a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your talk, dudes, and uh, we'll link up next week. We'll no, be on my show. No worries, brother. Peace. Take care. Take care, Elliot. Later, boys. Bye, bye, Elliot. Do, do you guys think, I mean, does this make sense? Why I'm I'm banging the drum so hard? I don't just want to talk about the precision weapon of prayer. I, I I do. It is real. I I love it. I love what you're reading, Will. But like, I actually wanted to to talk, like like take this bull by the horns, you know. And and like when I talk about feminism, for instance, there's a way by which it's like, dude, men are totally failing. Feminism is a sin by omission of men, too. But I don't want to emphasize that so much at the beginning, because even though it's true, that's the more comfortable safe space for people that have been infected by feminism is for them to follow the first rule of feminism, which is always talk about a male flaw. So it's like, yes, the sin by omission of men standing down to feminism is something. But let's talk about the, the active sins of women first in feminism, then we can talk about men because I don't want to sound like I'm doing the usual obfuscation that all the other Catholics do. Like when I started talking about feminism a couple of years ago, all the other Catholics, aside from people that share my last name, were avoiding talking about it. Men have to be leaders. Women as leaders are shrill and out of control and have ruined the West. Um, so yes, there's there's true aspects that are easy pitfalls. And that's what I'm trying to do in today's conversation. Like prayer is a weapon. The rosary is a weapon, but I don't want to reduce the whole show to like, this is what, that's not what today's show is mainly about. Today's mainly show is mainly about like, look, you should be equipped to get into street fights if you're actually speaking with a loud voice. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. 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 I think so. Totally. There's, there's, got- yeah. There's various aspects, various angles that this has to take take on and pray prayers one of those dimensions one of those angles but it, it's not exhaustive and you also when you're studying for a test it's comfortable and it's something i do a lot because it's one of my weaknesses i get lazy with certain kinds of corners i cut i'm just going to keep studying the stuff i know well that I'm, i have endorphins flowing in my brain as i go over the the stuff i know really well well i need to go over the stuff i don't know well the Catholics listening are probably the ones that need to get a, get a, you know, a hit bag and learn a a couple different martial arts lift, hit the weights. That's probably the more striking thing to be worked on for most Catholics. Listening, most Catholics have a pretty good prayer life. If they're listening to this show, you you see what I'm saying? So Mm. we're trying to work on it's both. And, but we're also emphasizing where we're weakest first. Like when you study for a test or a quiz, go to what you don't want to study first. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What, what do you say? Well, yeah, I think that makes sense. The more people are offended by this, the more important it's probably going to be to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look like, Hey, we, we've got about 40,000 subscribers. Those are, those are hard, hard fought. In the precise sense that, like, I don't, uh, this people, you know, this channel has never been about taking the easy turns. And the easy turns is it, trads tend to go, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Like saying the Novus Ordo is better and, and going focus missionary and saying all the politically correct stuff. Well, of course, but there's also a politically correct way of doing, running a trad Catholic channel. I know exactly what to say. I could say it in 10. I could put a, a bullet point of 10 things that I that I don't fully believe that would be very popular. Chum in the water, red meat in the water right away, but they need to be pushed back on. And, and one of them was a major like inflection point for this channel. The main problem in Christendom is not getting any better addressed in trad communities than in Novus Ordo communities. And that that was women run the church, women run the families. Even, you know, there might be the superficial appearance. If you go to a trad dinner party versus a Novus Ordo dinner party, the, the wife will kind of be, who is really the boss in most of these homes, will be kicking the husband under the table going, you have to lead the prayer. I'm not going to lead it. Whereas in the Novus Ordo household, she's the one leading it. But it's still her She's still the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, right? And choosing to address that rather than doing every other show on some aspect of the TLM. I do do a lot of Francis shows. I'll admit that. That's kind of red meat in the water, but it's also breaking news. That's how I justify that. But it's kind of like you make a you make a decision. Like, which way are we going to go? Are we going to try to give the audience what they want when we can, but also challenge them, challenge them. And, and that's, that's, you know, for people that, that know and love this show, that's, that's what we've tried to do. And it, it's reflected by, you know, the, the smallness of uh, the, the moderation of the size of subscribers that we've had through the years coming, c- coming as I was from such a big channel. It was, it was a deliberate choice, people. You have to but do the, that. the people opposed to the message of patriarchy Ultimately, that would lead you to your family being under attack and you shying away from your duties under natural law as the protector and putting your wife out in front as the human shield, saying, you deal with it, darling. There's a bad man banging at the car window trying to get in. And well, if the roles of the sexes and the proper ordering in the marriage don't matter, then as the husband, just sit back and let your wife lead and take charge. Right. Most people can see that's absurd, but if it's absurd there, it's also absurd elsewhere in the running of the household too. People just think they can get a pass on it. Yeah, they do. They do. Hey, I'm trad. I'm trad because I go to the TLM. Well, let's see. Let's see when it counts. And by the way, Will, I'm not sh- so positive. Just to bring things back to today's title, I'm not so sure because habit is destiny. Any Aristotelian believes that much, right? Habit is destiny. Habit is character. Uh, you know, virtue is not an act, but a habit. I'm not so sure 
that all these guys or some of these guys wouldn't let their wives be the one to get out of the car because their wives are leading day in and day out. They look to their wife for permission to do things. Their wife seems like she has a deep voice and carries a big stick. And of course, she's she's going to shrink in that situation. But I think a lot of the guys, because they're all of us are Pavlov's dog at some non-deterministic level. These guys are going to look to their wife. And and I'm not I'm not so convinced it wouldn't be that, even though it's absurd. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if that does happen, uh, the wife's not going to like it. She's not going to find you attractive. <laughs> no. so being, <laughs> being the feminist man, then uh, it's not going to get you the brownie points that you think it will. No, which is why politeness, the fake politeness that's overtaken the, the the liberal West is so bad for everything because the the fake politeness allows women to be the leaders um, in most day to day situations behind the facades of civil society, which are really paper thin. You even saw some of this during covid. Right. Once the facades off. And people aren't good Christians anymore, by and large. It's going to get nasty fast. And no one, no one, though, especially not the women, they are hightailing it out of there. No one wants a piece of that action. You know, when when there's a, a bad man at the door, a bad man rapping on the car window, uh, you know, the government knocking on the door in COVID in places like Canada, that that requires a man to to deal with it. Yeah, f- feminism eventually leads to countries becoming so dangerous out on the streets that women can't go anywhere unaccompanied. That's the irony of it. Yeah, look at Germany. Mm. I, yeah, and, and the men weren't stepping up. That's the point. That's the very point. The men get, uh, they're like, I don't know. I mean, this is, Mike, this is kind of your big thing. Even in the um, more physical nature of today's conversation, like, should men step up when, when women are being, when turfs are being accosted by trannies, should men step up and be like, Hey, you better back off this, this little lady. She's, she's a dame. She, you know, they don't like that. Right. So, so you're like, look, I'd pro and I always answer, you always text me this question every couple months. And I'm always like, that's when instinct just kicks in. I don't even think most of my street fights were mortal sins because i just have a i have a fusty instinct Mm. but uh you know i'd think about it yeah well i'm going to defend this jake even if yeah yeah i just think i'm just talking about like the whatever the 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 cop that's he's on hour 48 of his shift and his wife and kids are back at home and he's playing a referee between the turf and the trans guy beating the hell out of each other you know at, at what point has that guy done his duty and he he needs to extricate himself and defend his actual family as opposed to playing referee between these two groups that hate him. That's, yeah. that's more my question. Yeah. I think you were also asking the principle of it. Like, isn't this an injustice for, for a man to defend a, uh, a, a turf that's a, <laughs> a, a trans exclusive radical feminist yeah. from a trainee, you know, who's threatening to beat her up or, or just accost her, you know? Yeah. I guess in principle, this is unjust, but, it's, you know, Aristotle says it's better to suffer injustice than to do it, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's what it boils down to. Yeah. I mean, look, so, I mean, just, just to come right down to it, to put things in plain terms, I've said this before, I was a white basketball player, and that's where a lot of, that's where a lot of my brawling situations came in. So we, we started out this conversation in a more high-flown, I think, appropriate way. You know, when is it appropriate for the church to defend herself? When is it appropriate for individual Christians to defend themselves? That's that's reasonably clear, even though I I think we we um, answered Elliot's question pretty fairly. But most fights and all almost all the ones I've been in are more morally ambiguous. And I'm saying that even though I might or might not have seen, you know, just being a white basketball player getting called um, nasty things by black racists, uh, racists who are blacks and get, you know, getting into fights there. Uh, Cause I don't, cause I'm not going to take shit in that, in that context that, you know, it's, it's applicable. What we're saying is still applicable to good Christians that would be more 
more concerned as I am now with what, oh, did I just sin by getting in that fight earlier today? I didn't really care when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, but I care now, but I'm saying these things are applicable. First off, I, I hear a lot of people, Mike, you're a wrestler. Can we just pivot into this for a second? I hear a lot of people go, oh, you need to know BJJ to defend yourself. Uh, parish orphans and retrogrades. If I don't know how many hairy situations everyone's been in, but if you're in a scrum with multiple people, you got to know how to strike on your feet too. This goes both ways because you're going to get stomped out. In, I, I mean, I've 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 been in this situation where it got very real. Uh, we we had to defend my friend who was choking out a dude on the basketball court um, because his friends were coming over and and trying to stomp my friend who who had him in reverse guard. <laughs> yeah, last place I'd want to be in a street fight is on the ground. So yeah, yeah you need uh need to have. Have everything in your toolkit just in case. Yeah. And I'm not saying I do. I mean, you're, 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 the, you're a, a very, very good collegiate wrestler. And that, that really showed when you fought that guy four months back, uh, cause you just took him right to the ground. But the point is there are all of these strategic errors that this is why, um, the UN war gamed out, uh, uh, the planned, Epidemic. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't know if that's a buzzword to, to shove those two words into one, but the planned epidemic was war gamed out on October the 18th, 2019, uh, Johns Hopkins Center together with the Gates. And because you don't know, little unexpected stuff comes up if you run it the first time, but if you run it the fifth time, you see a lot of the unexpected things. So they're, they turn out to be expectable unexpected and that's what happens a lot of times in street fights so mm -hmm. when i just flew this show title on twitter i i got the the pearl clutchers that was utterly expected oh catholics shouldn't fight blah 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 christianity is pacifism no that's wrong but i also got the what's come to be kind of expected people going oh just bjj that's all no that's not true dude you haven't <laughs> that's not the case yeah one-on-one -on -one, if you can guarantee in a octagon like setting that no other people are going to run up to you and um stomp you out then then bjj is great one-on-one -on -one. but especially if you're good at it but um no i literally have had to defend friends and brawls i I've, I've run these things a few different ways and uh had to defend my friend who was very good at bjj who was going to get you know just stomped by the other dude's friends even though he was dominating the guy that was on the ground you know homie g guy that started static in uh in a basketball game in south dallas on the day of my graduation from college i have two black eyes in all my college graduation photos nice. um so yeah you, you this is the kind of stuff where it's like well it's not it's not good to fight it's bad but I've learned stuff now that I never would have known. And this has been run back a few times. You learn the different iterations of chaos, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. What do you say, Will? I'm just thinking of the actual novel fight club where one of the tasks is to go out and actually start a fight with a stranger and how this is an element of being masculine, you know, being willing to get into a fight, but coming back to our point about restrained power, really it's always better not to fight if you can avoid it. Yes. Um, I, I'd done a bit of MMA training for a couple of years and uh, I don't do it now, but one of the things that really struck me from when I did do it was talking to the guys there who were doormen, bouncers, saying that, you know, some of them were big, like 280 upwards pounds, tall guys like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, and they'd say... It's not the other big guys that we're worried about. It's the guy who maybe weighs 140, who's got a razor blade in his pocket and will mm. just slap you across the neck with it. Mm. Or it's his girlfriend who'll take off her stiletto heel and put it through your eye. Mm. And yeah. all concerns about honor or who's tough or who knows BJJ or who's got a good strike game, they all go out the window. That's where if guys are asking me what MMA skill should I learn, my gut instinct is normally just like learn how to diffuse situations mm. or mm. run away quickly if possible. Yep. Yeah. And by by no means should one ever start a fight. Yeah, like we we were talking about calling this fight club, Catholic fight club. And that's <laughs> the big problem is these guys are these guys in fight club, Tyler Durden 
is literally giving the assignment, go start a fight. Now, I st- and that's, that's utterly wrong, utterly sinful, utterly pointless, utterly stupid. Because again, some, some guy that's a buck 30 ends up cutting your neck and, and you die in a state of sin because you just started to fight. That's stupid. We're not saying that. But the, the reason that in Fight Club, the movie, that scene was funny is because it shows what what cultivated society, and I'm, I'm putting it in scare quotes, right? You guys can see that because we're a society all over the West that kills our most innocent babies mm. and holds up the mothers who do it as heroes. And even the pro-life movement won't say these mother, mothers are murderers, okay? We're not cultivated. We're, we're the worst of what we read about in Persia, Greece, and Rome. So we're not cultivated, but in this this sissified culture that thinks of itself as cultivated um the movie fight club shows how hard it is for all these guys to complete their assignment for the week when tyler durden says go start a fight they're shoving guys in coffee shop they'll do anything to avoid a fight and i'm saying to christians look society's changing rapidly Uh, agenda 2030 is progressing rapidly it's changing even here at home, not just abroad, rapidly. We need Christian men that can fight. I'm not saying be Tyler Durden or the guys that are going out starting the fights, but you're not going to, I don't think people are going to be able to avoid the fights even if they want to five years from now, 10 years from now. So I think, yeah, I think what the, the word that keeps coming to mind here is confrontational, right? Is that, that we need to have a to expect and to foster an ethic of confrontation. It doesn't need to be fight club. It doesn't need to be Tyler Durden running up, you know, trying to pick, pick a fight physically, but people need men, especially Catholic men need to expect to take on a confrontational posture in, in the world because the world has taken on a confrontational posture against us and, you know, hiding, Hiding in our church on Sunday in our, in our homes, that's not enough. It's, you know, like it, it, it just isn't. I think that's, I think that's the essence of it. That, that's, that was like me, uh, the school I was fired from. It's a bit like that scene with, uh, you know, uh, Gandalf and the Balrog on the bridge. At some point, a man just has to put the staff down and say, you shall not pass. <laughs> Yes. Uh, whether it's uh, your classroom or whether it's the front door of your household, mm-hmm. uh, that's a situation that you can't shy away from if it comes to you. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's really, I think that's really the goal of today's episode is diminishing the conceptual, the strong conceptual distinction in the minds of most Christians out there between what Gandalf did with the Balrog, saying "You shall not pass," and dialectical instances thereof with physical confrontation where we're we're, COVID should have shown you if you're Canadian and you listen to my show, Mm. we have a lot of Canadian fans. What do you do? They're coming to your home, forcing a vaccine that, you know, could be very harmful to your kids and wife. Are you going to let them do that? You have to say you shall not pass. That's not going out and starting a fight. That's being Gandalf. And when Gandalf does that, he says it, and that's honorable. The the Balrog advances still. Well, he falls off the bridge. <laughs> you know, and then they tumble down a bottomless pit and fight for the next like three days, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's a con- there's a conceptual connection, or at least a nexus, uh, um, that that people shouldn't. It's a both and thing. That's all I'm saying. Be confrontational. Mm-hmm. Don't start the physical components of fighting. But if you are more confrontational, Christians, there will be more fights that you get in that that, that turn physical, actually. Uh, that's all I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I, I guess I've been I feel like I keep banging that drum. And I don't know if you guys think that's uh, overstating the case, but I, that, that's strongly how I feel. No, I, I think it's right. And if you if you don't take the fights, then the Balrog is coming anyway, and there's no mm. happy ever after. So mm. you need to steel yourself for it and recognize that it's coming, and you may as well start cultivating courage now. Yeah. Some guy said to me on Twitter, he said, because I had Royce White on on Wednesday, and we were doing like a deep dive into deep state 
deep dive into the deep state and it was supposed to be into the deep church, but it was too deep a dive into the deep state to get into the deep church. So we'll do that on another one. And some guy said, this was really good. This show, and it was like the longest show I ever did. I don't do long format. It was like two hours, 15. He's like, this is really good, but it's like cheesecake. I, I can't do this every week. Have more normies. And I was like, dude, I don't want normies on my show. I've never tried to let normies on my show. Like I want to, normies are wrong. Um, doesn't mean every show is going to be about the deep state, but I, you know, normies are wrong, right? Normies uh, get condemned to hell. We want, we want to be radical Christians. And therefore, you know, it's a few and a many problem is what I started realizing, even, even among trads that, you know, people, people act like herd animals too often and, and get stuff wrong, even if they're right about what mass to go to. So we have to, we have to course correct constantly and challenge ourselves constantly. And, um, you know, today's show seems to be providing a bit of a challenge to, to some people on Twitter and even, even here in the comments, but I think it's important that men be able to protect themselves. That when you say it that way, people are more comfortable. But when you're like, okay, that means that sometimes you might wind up in some actual street fights. Then people start tugging at their collars. Does that make sense? Mm. Mike, what do you think of that? I was going to say, well, I mean, it's one thing to talk about the concept of courage. It's another thing to embody it. And these are two different things. And the embodiment of certain virtues requires certain capacities to be realized and uh, i don't think that that's you know like otherwise we're just we're just knocking around another concept and that's not that's not the same as as, as living it it's not the same as, as realizing it and i think that's really at, at the heart of what, what you're getting at that is that's at the heart of action theory i mean i challenge you um catholics out there who are listening to me, university students or ones who have been to a university, how many of your even good, faithful, Catholic, Aristotelian professors that taught you the Nicomachean ethics and they 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 sermonize brilliantly on courage? It's it's the, the first virtue, uh, first moral virtue treated of, I think, in book three, end of book three, early book four in the ethics. And it's beautiful because it's the kind of test case you know, the system for habituating virtue, you know, vices of deficiency on one side, vice of excess on the other. It's usually the the example you give. Rashness is a vice of excess of the stuff of courage on one side. Cowardice is the vice of deficiency on the other side. This is how it's going to work for all the other virtues. So most professors that have ever taught it, like me, use courage. But how many of your professors have cultivated courage, have done what Aristotle's saying to do. You got to put this to the test. That's another reason that fighting's not all bad because you, you know, that's another great line from Fight Club. Like, how do you really know yourself as a man without, he says, getting into a street fight? I, I'm saying that's basically the same thing in cultivated society as putting your courage to the test. I'm not saying start fights, don't. But somehow that you got to find a way in day-to-day -day boring, boring post-Christian life in the new secular left sort of polite society to test your courage. Without testing it, you can't build it. And I just don't think many of my pencil-necked professors, I, I don't think any of them have ever thrown a punch. And I just that just makes me mistrust a man. I, I, it makes me mistrust a man. I'm sorry. Is that wrong? So uh, you're, you're choosing a really weird demographic, though, you know, I mean, pencil neck <laughs> professors that <laughs> I don't know, it's a, they're a some of our huge, heroes, huge segment of the, the population. Yeah. It's it is. But a huge segment, Mike, we just wrote, don't go to college, bro. A huge section of the population, particularly the Catholic population, goes to decent Catholic schools and so, and they're all taught the ethics at those decent Catholic schools. And they're like, yeah, my professor said this. I, I really admire professor so-and-so. It's like, okay, well, what does he really know about courage? That's all I'm asking. I'm just, I'm just being like the gadfly of Athens, Socrates. What does that cat really know about college, uh, about courage? And he knows a lot about college, but uh, <laughs> what does he know about courage? And mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's a hundred percent of them. It's not, but if they looked like you or 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 Will or Elliot, then I'd be like, this this cat probably knows something about courage, but that's not what most of them look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
All right. Well, I think this is pretty good. You guys have any parting parting shots, which is a military term. No one be offended. <laughs> uh yeah. I just uh I think this is this is a really appropriate topic to be talking about right now. Uh just because like Elliot said, you know, it this this starts with having the courage to speak and to speak truth and to then have the really have the skin in the game and the, the physical capacity to back that up. And uh, I think that all those things are related. And uh, right now, the way the world's going, whether you speak or whether you don't, you know, they're, they're going to regard even silence as being violent. So, you know, we, we should anticipate that the confrontation is coming towards us and we, we need to respond uh, appropriately, which, which means leaning into it. And that means, you know, having the physical capacity to do so. How much you will? As with the real uh, Fight Club novel, I want to set everyone some homework. Uh, here's your Fight Club homework. I, how about you you tweet that homosexuality is wrong, that feminism is wrong, and that men should be strong. And then if you get pushback from that, you don't shy away from it. You engage a bit. And then you stand for what you believe in. Tim mentioned being radical. Radical means going to the root. And feminism in particular, if you follow Tim, you'll recognize as the root of much disorder. It's not solely a female problem. It's also a male problem, but it needs to be called out. 